Should I get started? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Naveed Mahmood, and I'm an assistant professor at Florida Institute of Technology. Thank you for being here. And today I would like to talk about uh, my work, which is on quantum classical machine learning using Qiskit. So Qiskit is an open source SDK uh, that enables the development of quantum algorithms and quantum circuits. And this will be like an introductory uh, talk on how we can build models, both classical and quantum, using this uh, Qiskit library, which is Python-based. So a little bit about where I work. Uh, Florida Institute of Technology is located in Melbourne, Florida, which is on the east coast of Florida or the Space Coast. It's uh, one hour close to the NASA Kennedy Space Center. So from the campus, we usually see a lot of space flights going off, and we're pretty much excited about it whenever there's a space flight. And this is our department, uh, the electrical engineering department on the left, and on the right, you have the, the computer sciences building at Florida Tech. A little bit about my research group. So it mainly consists of PhD and master's students right now. And it focuses on uh, the algorithm and application development of quantum computing. Mainly, we investigate algorithms with uh, more efficient circuits. And also, we investigate the applications, useful applications in quantum computing, one of which is quantum classical machine learning, which we'll talk about today. And on the other, other side, I also investigate the verification and benchmarking, that is how we can develop hardware platforms based on GPUs and uh, FPGAs, which can help us simulate quantum circuits and can be used for verification and benchmarking. So these are the two branches of uh, our research. So if uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with quantum computing, it's one of the, the exciting and emerging technologies of computing today. It's not that quantum computing is going to replace the classical computing or supercomputing that we have. It's just that quantum computers are just better at specific operations uh, and performing operations which have uh, probabilistic processes involved with them. And that, that's because qu quantum computers can harness the uh, quantum mechanical properties such as superposition and entanglement. Uh, which helps them converge to the solutions much faster than a classical deterministic computer would do. I mean, a, a classical computer can emulate those probabilistic properties by sampling data iteratively, but quantum computers using superposition can reach that solution uh, much faster for specific operations. So what are those uh, specific operations? Possible areas where we can see quantum advantage are quantum simulation, that means if we can, if you want to simulate chemical processes or uh, chemical computation, like uh, results of reactions, we can use a quantum computer to speed up those processes. Cryptography, cryptography, one of the notorious quantum algorithms is Shor's algorithm, which uh, if we have a powerful quantum computer can be used to break uh, encryption systems of today, such as RSA and that potentially threatens the internet that we have. Uh, other possible fields are optimizations, like uh, traveling salesman problem, max cut graphs, et cetera. And then finally, we have uh, machine learning. So quantum computing promises a lot, uh, significant impact in machine learning. And machine learning itself has had a significant impact in, in the technology we have today. So what is quantum machine learning, or hybrid quantum classical machine learning? So it's an intersection of uh, different concepts between uh, from quantum computing and machine learning. So we can think of it as uh, how quantum computers can help speed up machine learning tasks such as training models or inferencing from models. We can also think of it as how machine learning models that exist today can help discover newer quantum circuits or more depth efficient quantum circuits uh, we can also think of it in terms of data. That means if we have classical data, how can we process it using some quantum algorithm or, or a quantum computer? How will the classical data be encoded in, on the quantum domain? We can also think of if we have some quantum data, for example, from a quantum sensor, which is observing some uh, biological process or chemical process, and we take that quantum data 
and try to process it using some classical method or quantum method. So these different interplays uh, gives rise to this uh, interdisciplinary field which is quite uh, instigating quite a, a good amount of research right now which is quantum machine learning. And uh, the work that I will sh uh, talk about today is mostly taking classical data and processing it using uh, quantum methods or quantum uh, models. And I'll talk about how Qiskit helps facilitate that, that process and helps us build uh, useful frameworks. So a little bit about quantum computing, the basic concepts. Uh, I like to think as there are three basic fundamentals which one should understand in order to understand quantum computing. Even, uh, even without any background in physics. Uh, so the, the concepts are qubits, superposition, and entanglement. So qubits are the, the equivalent of the classical bits, zero and one. Qubits can exist in two computational basis states, the ket zero and ket one, uh, uh, which are represented by the poles of this block sphere representation. But the qubit can also exist in any point on the surface of the sphere, and that represents the overall state of the qubit, which is also given by this expression, which is, because you can see, is a linear sum of the basis states, ket0 and ket1. And the coefficients uh, depend on these angular parameters, theta and phi. So by manipulating these angular parameters, we can manipulate or change the coefficients or amplitudes as they're also known as. And we can manipulate the outcome state of, or the output state of the qubit. Now the output state of the qubit, even when it is in superposition, when we measure it, it collapses to a classical zero or a one. So depending, and that depends on the value of the coefficient of the amplitude. Uh, according to this relation, the higher the amplitude, the higher the will be the probability. So we can manipulate the state of the qubit towards the output classical state that we want by manipulating the angular parameters of this state. So that's mostly how quantum operations are applied on qubits and we achieve our desired output on the quantum computer. So that was one qubit uh, which, uh, which had two basis states. What if we have multiple qubits together? So this will span exponentially a larger ex state space. So three qubits will have eight basis states, and now we can have more data uh, encoded as the amplitudes of that quantum state. So this gives rise to some inherent parallelism in the quantum computer. Now you can operate or place operations or gates on all these eight states in superposition together, which forms one quantum state, and that's what leads to faster computations or faster convergence to the solution. So superposition is a, uh, one of the interesting properties. And the other one is entanglement. So when you entangle two qubits together, it creates a strong correlation between them so that measuring one qubit gives us information about the other, even without looking at or measuring the other qubit. And that can be achieved by a simple circuit like this where you have two qubits starting from the zero state and you only have, at the output, you only have the zero, zero or the one, one state existing. That means measuring one qubit will give you the state of the other. And entanglement is, is interesting because when you uh, entangle two qubits which have data encoded in them, you create a strong correlation between the data which helps us create more efficient machine learning models as you will see the use of entanglement in the models uh, in the next slides. And then we have quantum gates which apply the transformations or transform the quantum states by rotating the angular parameters. We have uh, one of the popular gates is Hadamard gate which is used to create superpositions. The control knot is a two qubit gate which is used to entangle, which can be used to entangle two qubits. And we have uh, Ry and Rz gates, which are rotation gates, which can rotate the, the qubit state by the angles theta and phi, respectively. So these are some useful gates which have been used in this, in the models that we'll see next. So our work is using quantum machine learning for sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is interpreting emotions or sentiment from 
digital text so that we have better insights from uh, everyday digital sources like emails, tweets, uh, reviews, news portals, etc. So in our methodology, we are using two data sets, English, uh, and an English data set which is from Twitter and a Bengali data set which is from a Bengali news portal. And we are combining both classical and quantum methods. The classical methods are mainly pre-processing and dimension reduction methods like PCA and wavelet transform. And the quantum methods are using pre-built quantum models like the quantum support vector machine and the variational quantum classifier. These are models that are already available in the Qiskit library. This is our proposed framework. So from the left, starting from the left, we have the sentiment analysis data sets, which undergo, undergo some pre-processing, text pre-processing and word embedding. And then the next step is dimension reduction using two methods, PCA and hard transform. After that, uh, the framework branches out to two parts. We have uh, the top part, which is the Classi uh, classification by uh, classical methods like a support vector machine, and then we have the bottom part which undergoes the quantum methods like the quantum feature map and then the quantum classifier using models such as the quantum support vector classifier and the variational quantum classifier. We'll go over these models a bit later on. And then at the end we have the classification of the data and we're comparing both the classical path and the, the quantum classical path for our analysis. So starting with the pre-processing, these are very basic uh, steps where we split the, the headline and the sentiment columns or assign the label and the data columns from our data set. One example is shown here from the Bengali news portal data set. And then we also split it into test, train, and validation data sets. And then comes the word embedding. We used uh, scikit-learn's count vectorizer, which transforms the text into a sparse matrix representation. So we lay out the, lay, lay out the vo vocabulary, and then we match each sentence with the word, uh, and there is a one for that match. So it's a sparse matrix representation of this text using the count vectorizer, which is generally the, the normal method when it comes to natural language processing. Then we have dimensionality reduction. So we use two methods. One of them is the, the principal component analysis. This is also widely used in dimension reduction and in machine learning. So this is a nonlinear uh, reduction method which computes the principal components from some data in a high dimensional feature space and it reduces the number of features of that data. So we use the kernel PCA imported from uh, scikit-learn, and you can see that we reduced the number of components to two here for this particular experiment using uh, the radial basis function as a kernel, and then we converted both the test and train data sets, reduced to only two features for our next processes. We also used Har wavelet transform which transforms the data into groups of high frequency and low frequency components as shown here. So you can see the, the top left group is the low frequency components and it's, an, it's a compressed approximation of our original data that is contained in the low frequency components. So you can see it pre preserves both spatial and temporal. So if, if, this, if, this was a, if this was a video, you would see that it also preserves both spatial and temporal locality of the data. And that's why it's very useful for as a compression. And it's also multi-level decomposable. Which, that means we can apply it in multiple levels and in packet and pyramidal forms to achieve the, the compression. We used the Mahota's uh, library for this, which is a computer vision and image processing library for, from Python, for Python. And it contains a 2D 2D packet HAR wavelet function, which we have used in our work. So after applying the HAR function, we have to extract the low, the low frequency area of the data. And then we can apply this for multiple iterations as many, for as many levels as we want to compress the data. So back to our framework. 
we will now go over the quantum methods. So now after dimension reduction, the, the data now goes through a quantum feature map and then the quantum classifier. So we'll talk about these two models next. So quantum feature map. We know a feature map transforms data to a higher dimension space so that it makes, us, makes it easier to do tasks like classification, for example, in a support vector machine. So the quantum feature map does, map does something similar, but it encodes the data which is in the classical domain into the quantum domain or the Hilbert space domain uh, so that it can be used further for uh, for the tasks such as classification using a support vector machine. So to encode the classical data onto the quantum domain, we have to use a quantum circuit, and it has to be a parameterized quantum circuit where the parameters depend on the input data that we want to encode into the feature map. So the circuit looks like this. We use Hadamard gates to put it into superposition, and then we use phase rotation gates, which, which are the P gates shown here. And if you see, the, the parameters of these gates contain the input data, which is a vector, x0 and x1, followed by a C0 gate, which entangles the qubits. And then we have a second order uh, of uh, rotations, which is a P gate on the lower qubit, which also contains both the input parameters, x0 and x1. So this circuit is produced by the class which is from the Qiskit library here, imported poly feature map. These gates, rotation gates are poly rotations, that's why it's called a poly feature map. And we specify the number of features that we want, which is the shape of the data, of our data set. And we call this function poly feature map with the, the number of dimensions, the number of repetitions. And we can also control the amount of entanglement in the circuit. Right now this is set to linear, that's why we have only two entanglements, but we can also use full entanglement which will add more C0 gates, add to the depth of the circuit and will introduce more entanglement into the circuit. So this was the construction of the quantum feature map which encodes data from the classical to the quantum uh, space. Then we want to give this circuit to a support vector machine and overall this is called known as a quantum support vector machine. So for this, we use a number of uh, classes from the Qiskit library, such as the sampler, which simply samples the output or, uh, or samples the output of the quantum circuit, and Fidelity computes the fidelity of that output, that is, it compares the state to another state, and that's the inner product between two quantum states, that's the fidelity, and then using the fidelity, we use it as a kernel function and create a kernel object. So this is done using the fidelity quantum kernel where we pass in the fidelity and the feature map that was encoded in the previous circuit. Now with this kernel, we give it to uh, the QSVC class, which is also from, imported from the Qiskit model, and we specify the kernel that we just created to the QSVC. So the QSVC is basically the quantum feature map circuit and a support vector machine working together we take the output from the quantum feature map and produce a kernel matrix which is given to the support vector machine which is used for classification. So we can call the dot fit function of the QSVC class and give the training data to, to fit the model according to the output data and the labels, output labels. And then we can check the score, the test, the train and the test classification scores by calling the dot score function, and that, 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 that's how we implement, or Qiskit implements the QSVC, or quantum support vector classifier. So this was one implementation. The other implementation for classification is the, the variational quantum classifier. So the previous implementation used kernel-based methods. This one is purely quantum circuit-based. So for that, we first create an NSAT circuits, an NSAT is a parameterized quantum circuit which for which we can tweak the parameters uh, and try to minimize the loss or try to minimize some loss function uh, for classification. So we construct this ANSATS using, again, rotation gates where which has some parameters which we will tweak using some optimizer. 
and then we construct the VQC using this N sets combined with the previous feature map that we encoded, a sampler, and a classical optimizer. So the VQC is a combination of the quantum circuits of the feature map, the N sets, uh, which produces a quantum circuit output, which is sampled and evaluated by a loss function, which goes into an optimizer, and the optimizer tweaks the N sets parameters to reduce the loss to minimize the loss. That's how the NSATS is trained, similar to how we train machine learning models classically. And the training is done using this pqc.fit function, and where we put in the, the data that we want to train the model with and the output labels. And we can then catch the scores using the dot score function for the VQC class. So those were the models that we have used in our work. So let's look at some of the experimental results that uh, show the performance of these models. So we've used three implementations here. Uh, firstly, the SVM classifier with the quantum kernel, the QSVC, which is similar to the SVM classifier with quantum kernel, but it uses native Qiskit API. So these two columns, the first two columns are basically the same implementation, but with different APIs. So we did this to see the difference in Time, take, uh, time taken to train those models. And then the, the last column on the right, the VQC, is the variational quantum classifier, classifier, which is the variational classifier, which contains the ANSATs and the feature map circuit. So comparing the test accuracy of all these three implementations, uh, and we used, for the data set, we used the Twitter data set, which is the top table, uh, bottom table, and the Bengali news portal data set, which is the top table and we used PCA to reduce the number of data features. So the number of data features is equal to the number of qubits, as you can see on the left, and we varied it from two to six. The number of data points were same, and we saw an accuracy which was very similar for all three methods, which is around 70 to 70, 72%, which was also comparable to the pure classical implementation which is also 72%. So we see here that the quantum models per were performing as good as uh, the pure, purely classical models, which was uh, a good indication for our research that there is potential in quantum classical methods. Another interesting thing is the VQC performed uh, best in the time, shortest time taken to train compared to the QSVC and the SVM classifier with the quantum kernel. And similar results for the Twitter data set. Our next experiment, we applied both PCA and hard transform. So, so PCA was applied to reduce the number of features to two, and then we applied the hard compression to reduce the number of data points. So you can see here by increasing number of levels of compression, we are reducing the number of data points, training data points from 582 to 17. So what we wanted to see is the effect on the test accuracy, training accuracy, as well as the time, uh, time taken to train. So obviously we expected a reduction in the training time, uh, which is reflected in the data. Interestingly, we saw that for the classical accuracy, which is uh, the the, the rightmost column, as we increase the number of compression levels, the test accuracy drops significantly from 84, 85% to almost 29%. But for the quantum models, for all three of the, the quantum classical models, you see that the, the test accuracy is almost constant around 71%. So from this experiment, we could conclude that applying hard transform in, in combination with the quantum classical models had more beneficial effect compared to the classical accuracy, which dropped as we increased the number of quantum, uh, as, as we increased the number of HAR compression levels. So this uh, combination of HAR, HAR transform and quantum classical methods could be a good candidate for when we are using large data sets or large models and we want to apply some compression on them. And this was done for the Twitter data set. So I'm almost at the end of my talk, and in this slide I'm showing where uh, uh, I, I, provided, I provided a link where we can 
where you can install Qiskit, and it also gives a tutorial which uh, which modules of uh, which modules to install for Qiskit if we want to develop a framework similar to this. Uh, basically, the modules that I installed for this work was Qiskit, Qiskit IBM Runtime, Qiskit Visualization, Machine Learning, PyLaTeX, and Qiskit Algorithms for the classical algorithms like uh, the optimizer algorithms. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much, Dr. Petra. We have time for questions. Hi, thank you so much uh, Hi. for the presentation. Um, I work at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we have uh, IBM uh, quantum computer there, so uh, we're interested in all the work that's going on. Um, do you, did you run this on quantum hardware? Um, no. The, OK. That's a good point. This was still done at the simulation level. OK. And I know that uh, IBM right now is doing a lot of migration towards quantum hardware, so they have changed their API yeah. a lot. Yeah. So the, our next stages would be to use the newer APIs to run it on the quantum hardware. And just curiosity, because yeah. I'm going to go back and look at the recording and you know just look at the presentation multiple times, uh, okay. just for myself. But what version of Qiskit were you using here? Um, yeah, I can check. It was 40. I can actually see here in the command prompt. We used 1.0.2. Okay, so after yeah, Qiskit version the, the, the latest one, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi there. Uh, Hello. I'm a student graduate student in mathematics. Do you have any idea of what variations of quantum computers, will, how they will affect your algorithms? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, there's different quantum computers offered by different uh, companies, like right. IonQ or right. IBM. Yes. Do you have any idea how they would affect the algorithm? There's different de decoherence rates and uh, FX. Right, that's a, a really good question. So far, my work has been uh, concerning superconducting qubits, uh, which are systems developed by IBM. I haven't used the ion trap systems like from IonQ, uh, but the machine learning models should be the same. Uh, it, should, it should work similarly for ion trap as well as superconducting computers. But you have quantum annealing computers, which are a different set, which are a different breed of quantum computers. So it wouldn't be applicable for those. But for any circuit, quantum circuit based, uh, any quantum computer that can deploy quantum circuits, the framework would, would work the same way. Okay. W was that your question? That answered that question. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it's a long walk. Um, so I was under the initial assumption that you were using the Qiskit runtime. Um, but you, you asked, so how are you kind of virtualizing to create like a similar performance there? So this code was not initially using the Qiskit runtime, but the models that, uh, like QSVC, when you run the fit functions, they run the batches underneath, under the hood. So you don't have to use the runtime yourself. But as I said before, uh, now they're migrating towards different API, which, which encourages the use of the runtime more. So I'll be looking to convert this code to the new API or migrate to the new API. So it's using the older models, which runs the runtime, which runs the, the batches underneath in the backend. So 
from a quantum perspective, is that running it in two kind of separate forms and then combining them? I'm not sure I understand. It's still running on the quantum circuit simulator. OK. Yeah. OK. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you.